26 in the Republic and 6 in the North under British rule. I'm starting my journey in the North before crossing the border and heading for the capital of the Republic, Dublin. Travelling south by train, I'll cycle through Cork and Kerry before sailing to Inishmore in the Aran Islands. Finally, I'll hike in Connemara and Donegal before ending my journey on the wild and remote Tory Island. Two hundred miles of rugged remoteness, the spectacular Antrim coast in Northern Ireland reaches a geological climax at one of Ireland's essential landmarks, the Giant's Causeway. There's two theories about how this was built. The best one is a giant lived here called Finn McCall, and he fancied a Scottish giant over the water, so he built a causeway over there, ran to get her, she didn't want to know, and kicked him out back here. The second one was that he built a causeway to Scotland because he wanted a bit of a rumble with the Scottish giants, went over, that was a bit too big for him, so he ran away, but they chased him, and he hid in a cot dressed as a baby, and when they came over, they saw him, thought he was a baby, and thought, oh, if that's the size of the babies, the giants must be out here. And they ran back again. Now, scientists think that these 37,000 black basalt polygons were formed 60 million years ago when there was an explosion underwater and it forced them all to the top. Personally, I reckon about three million leprechauns shinned it up here and gave it a bit of that in between the rocks. Ireland's world famous for its landscapes, but some of the most striking scenery is to be found in the less visited northern counties, like Antrim, where the rolling views of the Nine Glens go on forever. for his political troubles. And here is where it was felt the most, Belfast. While the conflict between the largely Catholic Republicans and mainly Protestant Loyalists continues, 1998's Good Friday peace agreement brought a ceasefire between them and the bustle back to the city centre. And if you're looking for some refreshments, you can't do better than one of Belfast's fine 19th century pubs. This is actually one of the oldest. It's about 150 years old. And it's even got the original gas lamps. That's what I like about it. But this is the best thing. Service. 
<laughs> Beauty, look at them. Lovely, thanks. <laughs> look at this. Oysters and Guinness. Mm, mm, mm. Oh. The first one of the trip. Mm. In the height of the troubles, there are hundreds of checkpoints like this all over the city. And if you lived here, you'd have to pass one every day. But since the ceasefire, all the checkpoints have been closed down. And the really weird thing, some of the areas that saw the most violence are now tourist attractions. And one particular ride, the British Army have said that they fired 1,500 canisters of CS gas in the course of that ride. The local population believed that they fired many more. During the Troubles, the, the Protestant Shank Hill and Catholic Falls Road were battlegrounds devoid of public transport. President of Sinn Féin. Today, the taxi companies that serve the divided area will give you a guided tour for about $15. I ventured into the Republican heartland of West Belfast. But was it quite dangerous when you started off the cab service? Well, it was, yeah. Eight of our drivers have been killed. Really? While working. I couldn't take you on the Shankle Road because uh, as a member of this association, I would be a legitimate target for the loyalists. Now, while the bulk of them are on ceasefire at the minute, it'd still be dangerous. I'd just give us tar and the uh, army control the top two floors. We're now on the Falls Road. At the start of the troubles in 69, there was streets running from the Falls Road on the Shankle Road. And in 1969, the uh, RUC and the B-Specials came along those streets and uh, they drove people from their homes and the loyalist mobs coming along behind them burnt the homes down. Consequently, you've uh, a peace wall which is between the Falls Road and the Shankle Road now. Why do they call it the peace wall? Well, it keeps the two factions apart, so it's, uh, it's more peaceful than having them uh, riding with each other. This is the more permanent face of the the peace wall, as you can see. Yeah. Before this one was built, it was just corrugated sheeting. So this is just like the Berlin Wall. On the other side is another housing stage. Yeah. They don't think that it's time to bring it down, then? Well, it doesn't look like it, because, as you will see, it's uh, a very permanent structure. It'll take a long time for both sides to, to trust each other. Journey South has taken me through Amar, an area known during the Troubles as Bandit Country. It's always done things its own way. Wow. That's a good shot, huh? Perfectly again. Yes. If he gets the bend, you'll hear the cheer going up shortly. All right. Yes, he's got the bend. That's, that's the a sure sign. Once, once you hear the cheer, you know he has bowled around the far corner. Wow. What's this game called then? This game is called road bowls. Road, road bowls. Road yeah. bowls. The ball is called a bowl. Right. And it's a 28 ounce steel ball. Yeah. And it's played on the same basis as golf. Uh, you cover the course in the least number of shots. Is this guy on like a marker or something? Yeah. The person standing on the road is right. a marker, and the player is trying to play the bowl right. through the marker's legs. Wow. And on that occasion, he, he played it perfectly right to the man on the road. Yeah, brilliant. 
it yeah. played it all over Ireland? Or? It's played in other parts of Ireland, but mainly in Armagh and Cork. Some people train with the press-ups, some yeah. people train with the pints. Right. <laughs> but the, I think I've spotted who does what, actually, in you, this match. You think it's easy to recognise? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to do the same thing, but... Yes, sure is. I'll take two to one of you. Where the Cork men were down and we played Michael Toll against the... Uh, the best in Cork. Yeah. And it was played for £6,000 a side. Six grand. Six grand a side. And there would have been as, as much again bet on the road. You mingled among the crowd, you'll have no bother getting a few pounds on. Really? What, even yes. halfway through the game? No, even halfway through the, the game. Yeah. How uh, much is it worth it for? We'll say a tenner. Come on, let's take a shot for a tenner here, all right? Yeah. On the, on you the hold the bat. Right, you hold the bat. You hold the bat. That's for townie man, yeah? You're on the tourney, man. You're on yeah. high toll. So why do you give me a tenner? Because you're holding the bet. You bet him a tenner, so you're holding the bet. Right. Now, if you lose, you're going to have to give him 20. No, unless I just get in the car and go the other way. Oh, well, you can do that as well. <laughs> oh. There it goes. Yes, we're OK, we're OK. No, I'm going to hit that ball. You need to be shouting. Oh. Come on, there it goes. He's pulled her across the road. He's Yes, the finishing line's just a few yards there. Harry told the man you back has scored the line. Right. And Conor McGuigan is playing to beat the mark. Oh, 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 no, no. What happened? Your man won. My man won. Well done. Your man won. So you collect your money. Can't be bad. Well, that was a very, that was a bit of shrewd gambling on your behalf. Meet you again. Yeah, cheers to you. Bye bye. I was still heading south, but the laws of Hitchin sent me slightly off course to Burr Island in Fermanagh. Well, it is, I've taken a little detour off the main road because I love all the Celtic myths and legends that scattered around the country. And what I'm looking for is a little statue called Janus, I think it is. It's 2,000 years old and it's a fertility statue. What's interesting about this site is it's like one of the first Christian burial sites. And it's nice because it's got a lot of old pagan Celtic sort of designs on the stones as well. And this is what I've come to look for. This top bit apparently is where they used to do blood sacrifices. Wow. And people even now put in little offerings. This is the side with the face. And I think this is the fertility site. <laughs> wow, look at the size of that. That is, I don't think you should see that actually. That's disgustingly, that's obscene. <laughs> I think people in them days must have been like a bit more virile, you know. All roads in the Republic lead to Dublin, eventually. The home of James Joyce, Trinity College and the River Liffey. His post office remains a shrine to Irish nationalism after being the scene of bloody fighting during the Easter Rising. This is the Temple Bar District, the centre of the entertainment of Dublin and hopefully good for cheap accommodation. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Not too bad. Looking for a room? Uh, yeah, we've just got beds left in a ten-person room for tonight. So, well, like a dorm or something? Yeah, that's right. OK, yeah, yeah that's cool. OK. How much is it? £11. £11. Pounds. £11 pounds. Mm -hmm. Right. Just need to fill that one out. And are they mixed? Or yeah, are they, they are. Sick? No, they're mixed. They all have they're en suite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, so this is your key for your yep. room. Just need to slide it in and out. One of the... Beep, beep. You can get a bed in Dublin for about $15. If you're prepared to share. Is there a free bunk in there? Yeah, go in there. Yeah, that one there. Oh, good. Cheers, go. Like Come on, mate. German prison camp. Yeah, you go out and enjoy yourselves, don't worry about me, yeah? yeah. See you later. See you later. Cheers. Oh, great. No, mates. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, have a good time, though. Even before the international success of U2, Ireland was a hotbed of musical talent. Today, everyone's struck on becoming the next big thing, and the Dublin Music Centre is a place to catch them.
This is Ange and she's heavily into live music in Dublin there. <laughs> Why do you think there's such an explosion of like Irish bands coming out? What's helped that? I don't think it's, there's always been loads of Irish bands. It's like the minute you grow up and you either grab a hurley or, or grab a guitar and it's, you know, it's brilliant that yeah. way. But I think lately, you know, with the Cranberries and U2 and people like David Holmes and, and Johnny Moy in the dancing, everyone's confident enough to say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be huge and, you know, I love doing it and this is going to be my job. People are taking it, like, seriously. But in Ireland, there's just that extra confidence. I don't know if it's because it's smaller or it's just there's an extra confidence. Everyone's convinced they're going to be superstars. And that, yeah. that makes it brilliant to go to the yeah. gig because the gig is always exciting. Is there sort of like up and coming Dublin bands that are making it big now? Absolutely. I mean, the yeah. two bands tonight, like Nina and Turn, are like yeah. both of them are literally on the brink of like breaking it internationally. And they've been following. It's a brilliant feeling in, in Ireland. Like it's yeah. everyone's into music. Is this? this is a uh, turn, they've just signed a deal and uh, they're working out a publishing deal at the minute and they're brilliant, they're yeah. top tip, yeah. they are going to be huge. The oldest surviving stick and ball game, hurling, is faster than hockey and more violent than rugby. I caught an All-Ireland semi-final between Kilkenny and Cork at the Sports Shrine, Pope Park. This is my first hurling game and I love it. It's such a fast game, you've got to be so fit. You know, one minute's at that end, then it's at that end. Kilkenny, they're, they're underdogs, yeah? Yeah, Kilkenny are the underdogs, yeah. Hey, Kilkenny! How come you're not in your strip? Well, I'm a neutral. I'm from Dublin. Ah. Thanks, I must have been running from Kilkenny as well. So. Yeah. Safer. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you allowed to run with it in your hand? No. If you run for two paces within your hand, it's a foul. You have to put it on the end of the hurl. Right. Run with it. Let's tip it up and down on the hurl. Wow. You have to kick it as well. But they break their feet if you kick it. What? Instead of a corner, you get what's called a 65. Right. Which is the ball is brought out 65 yards and you hit it back. And you it's can like score. From oh, you can score, yeah. Right. Yeah. Whoa, so if that had gone in the net, how many points would that be? Well, a point, a goal is three points. Right. Woo! Who can you fashion them, isn't they? They really are, yeah. Yeah. Okay, they call it stick fighting. You know? oh, right. Yeah. There's a famous uh, story uh, where, where John Wayne was over uh, filming the, the Quiet Man. Yeah. And he's brought to a game, you know, because he's kind of just touring around. And, yeah. You know, give him a cultural experience. They brought him this hurling match, you know. At a half time, this fella came up to John Wayne and said, Well, John, would you like to go down a stick yourself? And John Wayne said, in a, in a John Wayne way, he said, uh, Well, I'd sure as hell not like to be out there without one. <laughs> Swimmers on, I want to get a bit of sea air, so I'm heading to Cove down south. Hopefully, this is my train. Whoa. The rail network is not extensive in Ireland, and Dublin is the main terminal for trains to other parts of the country. Travelling south to the seaside town of Cove in County Cork, about three hours away.
Now, Cove is a small seaside town, but before, it used to be one of the most important shipping ports in the whole of Ireland. And it was from this quay that millions of Irish immigrants left to go to America. You see that jetty there? It's the last port of call that the Titanic made before it went on its doomed maiden voyage. In addition to being the departure point for one and a half million immigrants during the famine years, Cove also is a final resting place for victims of the Lusitania, sunk by a German submarine in the First World War. This event helped bring America into the conflict. I'm cycling west to County Kerry and the Dingle Peninsula before sailing to the Aran Island of Inishmore. But before leaving Kerry, I had to make a detour to Ireland's most visited tourist spot, Blarney Castle. Thousands of people come here every year just to kiss the Blarney Stone, because they believe it gives you the gift of the gab. I, oh, what do we do? Lie down. Hold the two bars. Hold the bars. Yeah, that bit down the bottom there, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mwah. Oh, how was that? Oh. <sighs> Gift of the gab, I was lost for words. changing landscape of Ireland. Oh, don't you just love it? Come and sample it for yourself. Oh, first hand. You see the ever-changing landscape in Ireland, I'll show you. The West Coast's miles of golden sand are a favourite with local stables. Drive on there, Tommy, drive on! Come on, Wes! Are these all your horses then, Oscar? All my horses out there. Wow, what are they doing down on the beach? Training them for race. Yeah. Is that yeah. where you teach them then? We teach them, yeah, mostly in the winter time. Three miles we get them. Three miles along the beach? Yeah, three miles along the beach. Does that give them a bit extra then? A bit extra fitness and stuff? Oh, yeah, give them a bit of the feet. And out onto the water then as well. Go for their muscles. Oh, onto yeah. The water. Ireland has produced some of the best horses in the world. Is it? Some Both for race and then for show jumping. Yeah. Why is that? They reckon that uh, the land in Ireland is sort of for breeding the horses also. But your horses, how are they yeah, getting on? Yeah, they're very good, yeah. Couple we, of winners? Yeah, a couple of winners and we have a very good sire. The big black horse. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the winner. You could have your shirt on it. You could have your shirt on it. And my shirt? A dead, yeah, a dead shirt. It's a bit wet. Yeah, won't yeah. be beaten. Promising, rejuvenating properties since 1926, Daly's hot seawater and seaweed baths are a Ballybunion institution. Before afterwards, is after you've had your bath, yeah. it's down to the sea for a swim, and then back in again to, to warm up. In your dreams. I ain't going out there. It's freezing in there. <laughs> it's fine. I've been out already today. Oh. Oh. Ooh. This is so slimy, it's all, all on my skin and that. Oh, look at this. Like gloopy. Oh, and like a horse has blown its nose on my skin. But after you've been cycling for a week, especially be good for saddle sore. Oh. Oh, yeah. oh, that was a relaxing bit. Now comes the nightmare. Oh, Bill Clinton played golf at one of Ballybunion's many courses, but I was heading inland to Listowel in search of some traditional Irish entertainment. <laughs> Pub 
obsessions are a part of Irish life, and if you're lucky, you'll find one going on just by chance. It's brilliant. I just put my bike up. I've been in half hour. Two pints of Guinness. Music. Everyone friendly and young and old is brilliant. It's like being in your own front room. <laughs> yeah, I'm just taking a trip over the water. Because that's where the Aran Islands is, just out there. 30 miles off the coast of Galway, I was heading for the largest of the three Aran Islands in Ishmore. Ferries run six times a day, and the hour long journey costs about $24. Isolated in the Atlantic Ocean, Inishmore's limestone landscape was barren until the earliest inhabitants mixed seaweed and sand to make soil. Rich in pre-Christian remains, it is one of the finest archaeological sites in Europe, Dunangus. Although people have been living on the island since 2000 BC, this fort was actually built in the Bronze Age. It's called Dune Angus after the chief that ruled in the area. And it's perfect location. You've got a big wall looking down the hill, and no enemy's going to come up here. If you can, time your visit for the yearly festival. <laughs> Celebration of traditional island life. It's a perfect opportunity to experience some folk music, maybe pick up an Aaron sweater, or just enjoy the Guinness race. This is Tom and he's volunteered me to help him out with a boat race. They're one short and I think he spot my muscles as I got off the boat there. So these are the boats, yeah? Yeah, we have number six. Right, OK. Yes, what kind of boats are they? They're coral snow. They're built for what well, we used to use three years ago for uh, for living, making a living out of the sea in them, but they're now used for, for rowing. Right. For rowing what are they called? Eh? What are they called? Coral means unsteady. <laughs> Unsteady indeed. The current race is a fiercely fought competition and with teams coming from other islands, it's a matter of Aaron pride. What's hard to believe is that these flimsy vessels were used for hunting whales until early this century. where it all happens after the festival. Everyone comes down here, have a bit of a knees up. It's called a Kaylee. I've got my best togs on, so I'm going to give it a go. Is there any drink in there? No. No drink. Teas and coffees? Yes. Yay. Yeah. And what? Minerals. Minerals. Oh, OK, thanks. Minerals. The queen of the festival was being announced and the whole island had turned out for the event. <laughs> One of those lucky girls could dance with me tonight.
Back on the mainland, I'm hiking through Connemara and Donegal before sailing to the remotest part of Ireland, Tory. Connemara is one of the last wildernesses in the country. The farmers eke out a living on century-old peat bogs, cutting the turf for fuel. It's a bit of a dangerous implement, isn't it? Well, wow. this is what they call a slain. A slain? You know, slain, yeah. yes. Yeah. And uh, it's basically uh, a one-winged sort of a spade, you yeah. know? Because if I show you in there, you know, and we've, we hear stories of men having uh, three sods in the air at the one time. In other words, the first sod would go out so far, you yeah. see. They'd be down for the second one, and the first one wouldn't have hit the ground. And then they'd be down for the third one before the first one hit the ground. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's they were, they were, serious sod action, isn't it? They were, they were considered uh, great men, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, they were great porter drinkers as well, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. To, to get rid of the excess, the excess energy of uh, the porter. Yeah. They, they cut this turf, you know, right. and they're full of steam, you know. It's not so simple, you know. No. You have to push it down and yeah. then leave her gently forward without breaking the implement. Leave it like that? that that's yeah. a museum piece now. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like soggy wheat and bix. Yeah, yeah. Don't. That's it. Don't. Keep pushing. Fuck. Yeah. 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 It's a kind of one sharp movement, you know. Yeah. It's just that yeah. I just ain't got the arms like you. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, all takes, it all takes practice. Oh, you're, 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 you're like an expert. Our great-grandparents and all the people that went before us, they depended on the turf yeah. to, um, to uh, heat their little houses and yeah. uh, to cook their food. The cutting of the turf is one aspect of it, but it was, there was also the searching for uh, the, uh, the timber in the bogs that would yeah. have come from our forests off the pass. And also, People uh, digging out the turf in former days used to find uh, stuff hidden by our ancestors. Oh, right, yeah, what sort of stuff? For, for instance, they found? Um, bog butter was the bog most famous. Butter? Bog butter, yes. It was one of, one of the ways of, um, of, pre of preserving things in the past. You see, they had no fridges right, or yeah. deep freezes. Yeah. Recently in East Galway, there was a huge lump of butter found, hundreds of years old. Wow. Still, the, the, the synthesis section was editable. Really? Know? Yeah, after all those years. Yeah, amazing. You must know lots of stories just in the land that you. Well, you see, that was yeah? part. That was part again of a ways of life. Uh, the ability to pass the time uh, through storytelling. You know, yeah. in former days, the whole family would go to the bog. You know, and if it was a nice, pleasant summer's evening, they'd stay in the bog quite late. You know, they'd bring the tea with them, and uh, they'd bring the, the bread, and quite often they'd bring a full cake. You know, and there's many stories about a lake monster yeah. in that particular lake there coming up in the evening, uh, you know, wandering around in the swampy areas by the lake shore, and the families used to run at that stage and go home. I've seen the monster myself in that lake uh, three times in my lifetime. We were gathering the sheep for the shearing, and uh, suddenly I was attracted to the lake, and uh, the, the sun was glistening, is the best way as I, I, I could describe it, of this object in the centre out there, and um, sparkling. And there was this very large, round object, you know, maybe about a metre, say a metre in diameter, uh, hard to say it was swimming or floating, or, but was moving, mm. and the sun was shining off it, and it swam into the reeds by the lake shore there. Yeah. And as it swam into the reeds, you could see the uh, the, the reeds uh, right. moving, parting, so that you knew there was a very very large object under the water. Right, Tom, I better go before the weather closes yeah. in again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks you know, for that. that. That's the joy of a bog. You know, yeah. you don't know who you're going to be running into, <laughs> and uh, when you're walking over the hill there, be careful. farm over there, cup of tea. I can stay here for weeks. The typical thing about the landscape is that it changes every five seconds. Like, you know, I've got all the clouds coming down there, now it's all cleared, and over there is sunny. Over here is quite dull, and over there is raining. 
And the colours changed as well. Look, that was green, now it's grey. Now it's going blue. I give up. I give up. How can I, I can't, how can I work like this? How can I work like this? With a break in the weather, I've enlisted local fisherman Paddy to take me out in his boat. We're fishing in the shadow of the Sleeve Lee Cliffs at nearly a thousand feet, the highest in Europe. What are we going for? Mackerel. Mackerel? Is that all? How do you, are they down there? Hopefully. So have you always been a fisherman all your life, Pad? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? What's the biggest one you caught out here? Blue shark. Blue shark? Yeah, yeah. Wow, well, how big was that? Uh, two metre. Two metre? Wow. You caught one? That was mine, Rod. Oh, yes. Come here. Come here. I'm going to... This one's called Roger. Hey, first fish. Look at that. Look at that. How many's on there? Paddy is often chartered by deep sea oh, anglers God, fishing for sharks, but I was quite happy with my mackerel. Oh boy! Oh, get back here! Oh! Look, one's just at one, two, four. Another one goes in. Oh, look at all that! It was just like afternoons fishing in there. No way! I think that's enough. Mackerel. Back on dry land, I was going to climb Crow Patrick. In 441, Ireland's patron saint, Patrick, spent the 40 days of Lent on this mountain, fighting demons and banishing serpents from the land. His vigil made the 2,513-foot quartz peak a sacred pilgrimage site for Catholics. Oh, no, look at that. It's so unnecessary. Oh. week of July, about 40 to 50,000 pilgrims trek up this mountain to the top, following the footsteps of St. Patrick, and apparently some of them even do it in their bare feet. <laughs> Can't even do it in boots. They're killing you. Have you not got your shoes with you? No, because we knew we brought them, we probably wouldn't do it. Where are they? You left your shoes yeah. back there? Yeah, at the bottom. You're not even halfway, yeah? Have you done it before? I've done it about six, seven years ago. Right, well... I wasn't quite as, as chubby then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit harder now. God, man. Good luck. All right, cheers. All right. It's the top, yeah? yeah? How long did it take you to get up here? An hour and a half. Up here. An hour and a half? Yeah. Man, did you run half the way? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Those boys here, they've done it in an hour and 15 minutes. Right. Getting all the energy back. That last bit's a killer, huh? Yeah, that's very tough. Yeah. I think this will be my last time. Ridiculous. For my final journey, 
are making the eight mile crossing to Tory Island. Pounded day and night by the Atlantic Ocean, the island was almost abandoned in 1974 after it was cut off by storms for two months. Apart from its inaccessibility and its barrenness, remoteness, Tory Island is actually famous because it's got a king. Hi there. Are you the king? That's right. Oh, <laughs> what a privilege. Hey, Bill of Archer of Gotari. Welcome. Ah, uh, thank you. What's what's that? Is there a reply? What can I say? Well, to Kate Bill of Archer, you yeah. say... Goody Mahagat. Goody Mahagat. What, what's that? Is that Gaelic, yeah? yeah? Thank you. Do most people speak Gaelic here? Oh, Must yes, do. of course. That's yeah. our first language. As a king, do, have you got any special duties or special clothes? That, no, no, is that not, the crown? No, or? not at all, not at no. all. Because if that was the case, people would have uh, people would have been thinking that I would be a very rich king. Oh, As right. a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm one of the poorest kings on earth. Are you? Well, that's rough. Isn't it? Rough and uh, happy, thank God, and uh, yeah. and are willing to uh, welcome uh, all visitors off the boat. Do you have like a big coronation, a big party when somebody As gets? Yeah, as a matter of fact, when the when the son and the daughter of the last king gave me the honour, uh, we had a big party, a big K Irish Oy, gale, yes, till six o'clock in the morning. Yes. Really? Oh, oh that right, sounds yes, good. Oh, and I will King Patsy's Island is only two and a half miles long and less than a mile wide, but despite a population of 125, Tory is thriving. The island has even managed to put itself on the artistic map with a school of painters, some of whose work recently sold in the States for $3,000. I met up with artist Anton Meenan at the Islands Gallery. And I suppose I, I get my ideas, you know, from, from mythology, you know. Mythology is very much alive and well in Anton's work and on Tory itself, which is rich in a culture banished from the mainland. Stories of the mythical Cyclops, Balor of the Evil Eye, the Celtic god of darkness are as alive today as they were 2,000 years BC. Anton took me across the island to Ballas Fort on the east coast. And over here is Tor Moore, where yeah. Ballas' daughter was in prison. Yeah. And she was guarded by five women. Right. And this is the famous, uh, the wishing stone It's famous for visitors coming, you know, and you have a choice. With you can get the three stones and throw three stones onto it. Yeah. Or you have the choice of going out and turning around <laughs> three times. The choice is yours, you know. Right, I'm going to go for the stones. I've got to get three stones to land on it. That's right. Uh, From here? Yeah, be careful, you know. One. Two. Yeah, last one. More. one last one. Yeah. Woo! Look at this, this is madness. Where else it's going to be but in Ireland? Standing on the most dangerous cliff, force eight, gale, thrown stones at a wishing stone. One, uh, two, uh. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. Thank you. 